Welcome to worship at Community of Joy. We exist because God made us. We're here because Jesus calls us. We're together because the Spirit connects us to each other. Let us worship as a community of love and joy.
God, thank you for a new day, a new day in which to place our faith and our trust in you, to experience your welcome here, your love for us, Lord, to recognize that we can turn to you in all things and trust that you hear us. And so this morning we come. We come eager to worship you. We come to give thanks to you. We come to acknowledge, Lord, that you are Lord over all. And so may we continue always to trust in and love, and faithfully follow you. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24 through 32. Here's another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked? 
No, he replied, you'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Here's another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches.
It's a rare occasion that Pastor Sharon gets to stay up. I don't know if you got my email or not, but just in case you didn't, uh, we did change next week's second Sunday lunch out, which was going to be a second Sunday lunch in to the next week. Sadly, there's at least uh, two people that aren't going to be able to make it, uh, or three people that aren't going to be able to make it then, uh, one who could have made it last week, and uh, two people who would have been away either week. So... You know, it's really hard to try to find a Sunday that works for everybody, but we had nine people that were not able to make it next week, and I just thought that was too many to to try to figure out. I mean, my goodness, that's all of us here this morning almost. (laughs) Um, And so we will have the soup lunch on the 19th now uh, after worship here. Uh, if there's enough that next week that want to go out to, to lunch at Hoppers, we can do that. Uh, you know, we always look for an occasion to go and enjoy being together, and so we can, we can do that next week. Many, many, many moons ago, when I was a boy, <laughs> you used to see and hear Bob White quail, everywhere. It was nothing to go out on the porch, the screened-in porch in the morning and sit there drinking a cup of coffee or, or just walking out and, and hear them whistling to each other down in the meadow or across the way in my dad's cut-your-own-Christmas-tree lot. Or to ride my bike from my house to my grandparents' house on the back lane over to the farm and have a, a covey of quail scurry across in, in front of me. They have that unique sound. And they have a really interesting scurry. You can see them a long ways away. They're not big birds, but you can tell what they are because of the way they, they travel together and the way they, the, the way they just move about. But sadly, it's been a lot of years, and I mean a lot of years, since I've seen a bobwhite quail. They're almost non-existent. I mean, there's still a few, but it was nothing to be able to go out and see them all the time. And if I wanted to hunt them, I could go walk in the woods, and I could guarantee that I would jump at least two or three coveys of quail and come home with some really good eating. Nothing better than quail breast wrapped in bacon, broiled. But those days are long gone. You can go out and look all you want. You can look for hours and hours. You can walk for miles and miles, and you won't come across a quail. Unless it's one that somebody raised and let loose because there are still some people that raise them. I bet it's been 20 to 30 years ago since I saw the last. So what happened? Why'd they disappear? Some folks will tell you that it's because we've got a whole bunch of foxes and that the, the fur market crashed and when that crashed and no one was trapping or shooting foxes, they started eating all the quail. Some folks might even tell you that we have some coyotes and the coyotes are getting them, but that's not it. I mean, that's part of it, sure, but that's not it. What happened was farmers changed their farming practices. They started caring about what their farms look like in a little better, a little different way than they used to. No longer do we have hedgerows or fence rows. When was the last time you saw a fence row in a field? You don't. Because we got this big equipment now that has to has takes an acre to turn around. And fence rows just get in the way. And 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 we don't have cattle. When was the last time you saw a herd of uh, milk cows out in the field? I I think there's only one dairy in all of Wicomico County. I mean, that didn't used to be. And so we had lots of pastures and meadows and and the kind of habitat that quail liked. 
And now we use chemicals. We don't just work the ground, we spray the ground. So we kill everything. We kill all of the scrubby brush that quail loved to live in. In an effort to clean up the land and make it more productive, we have nearly eradicated the quail population. What is it about us humans that feels the need to clean everything up and make it nice and tidy? I love the way Jesus teaches. He talks about parables. He tells parables, tells stories that have a meaning, that have a way of relating with us. We can all identify with his story this morning. Whether you're a farmer or not, you know what weed is, you've seen it grow, and you know what weeds are. In fact, some things we call weeds really aren't weeds, but we don't like them, so we call them weeds. They have a purpose. And it's not just to agitate us or get on our nerves or bother us if we're gardeners or farmers. Jesus teaches these parables to share some insight about the kingdom of heaven. And he uses concepts that we can understand so that we can understand the concept that's difficult to understand. And oftentimes, he cues in on that very thing that might shock us to get our attention. In the particular parable that we're looking at this morning, the first one, the one with the wheat and the weeds... Jesus says there's a farmer, and he goes out into his field, and he sows wheat. And then an enemy comes at night and sows weeds. And when they sprout and grow, his workers discover that there's weeds in the wheat, and they know that they didn't plant weeds with the wheat. And they ask the farmer, what's going on? And he says, well, an enemy has come and done this. And then their next question is, do you want us to go out and pull the weeds? Well... Of course. That's what you do with weeds, right? If you got weeds growing in your flower bed, you're going to pull them. If you got weeds growing in the garden, you're going to pull them. When we, when we work at the Camden Community Garden, sometimes all summer long, that's about all we do is pull weeds. Because weeds grow everywhere, and weeds, we don't want weeds growing in our gardens. We don't want weeds growing in our crops. And so the expected answer from Jesus, uh, in, from the farmer in Jesus' parable, was sure, go pull those weeds. But imagine how it got their attention when Jesus said in his parable, the farmer said, no, 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 don't pull the weeds. Let them grow. What? Let the weeds grow? Yep, that's what he said. You see, everyone knows that weeds don't grow in crop fields. And in that story, Jesus got their attention by saying that it was okay to let the weeds grow in the wheat. And that's the hook. That's what raised their eyebrows. That's what got their attention. Because it goes against common sense. It goes against the expected. It goes against what the practice was of the day. The practice of the day and the practice of our day today is to pull weeds, to clean it up. But the farmer says no. And he says, because if you go out and you pull the weeds, they might damage, you might damage the wheat. I mean, I'm sure that when you pull a weed, if it's got a very established root system, it's intertwined with the wheat, and that'll pull the wheat up, up as well. 
even if you went out at an early stage and you pulled the weeds, you're still going to do some damage to the wheat. You're going to walk on it. You're going to trample it. You're, you're going to do something. And the farmer's saying, no, don't do that because it might damage the wheat. It's not that they would intentionally do it. It's just a byproduct. It's just a reality of weeding when the weeds and the wheat grow together. We kind of do similar things when we set out to rid our lawns of dandelions. I mean, who likes to see dandelions growing in their lawns? Not many people in our culture. So what do we do? At the moment we start seeing those first dandelions bloom, that yellow, when that yellow pops up in our green, even if we like John Deere, we're getting out the spray. Or we're going to get the weed and feed and we're going to put it down. We're going to do something to get rid of the dandelions because it's not that we don't like the yellow. It's what we don't like about it is when they turn white. And the wind catches those seeds and they blow all around and they seed themselves. And next thing you know, our whole green grass patch is yellow. But when we do that, we harm the bees. And you knew I was going to get to that. When we rid our lawns of dandelions... We cause damage to the bee population. And it would be okay if we don't need bees in our world, but there's a lot of food that we like to eat that we wouldn't have if we didn't have bees. Apples and peaches and pears. All kinds of fruit and vegetables. Zucchini and squash. We need bees to pollinate those things so that we can eat. So we learn a couple of things, important things, about the kingdom of God in this parable. The first thing we learn is that God has a role, and we have a role. And our role is not the same as God's. Jesus uses this parable about weed, weeds and wheat to teach us about the role that God plays in our lives. Now, you have to leave the weeds and wheat aside to get there because he's really talking about people. And he's talking about the way we see certain people as wheat, as good, or as weeds, as bad. And it, and it is very clear in this parable that it is not our role to determine whether a person is wheat or weed. But we do it all the time, don't we? We do it quickly. We walk down the street, we walk into a, an establishment, and, and we're scoping out, and immediately we see somebody, and we form a judgment about them. Well, there goes a weed. <laughs> and then it affects the way we treat them. And when we treat somebody as a weed all the time, they begin to think they are. And then what happens is they start acting out. They start fulfilling that prophecy that we speak with our actions. We learn about roles, God's and ours. Our role is not to judge. Our role is not to determine who's a weed and who's a wheat. That's God's role. And if we continue to call people weeds in our society, 
we, we move away from the possibility and the hope that they might become something else. I think that's part of what Jesus is saying in this parable. If you go in and you pull the weed early, now a weed's never going to, you know, this parable only goes so far. A weed's never going to become wheat. But with humans, if we start out as a weed, there's a possibility we could become wheat. We could become good. And if we pull them, if we, if we push ourselves away from, if we push the bad people away from us all the time and we don't have any connection with them, if we don't recognize that they all, all people, are created in the image of God, if we don't start there, then we remove the possibility that transformation can happen in their lives. And that's a problem. And who appointed you or me to determine that? No one. That's the parable. That's what Jesus is saying in this parable, that it is God's role to determine what happens to the weed, to the weeds. I don't want to say weed, because <laughs> that's a whole different thing <laughs> in our culture. The second thing we learn from this parable is that we learn about patience and waiting, and we also learn that in the second parable. It was a very short couple of lines where Jesus says the, the smallest of seeds is a mustard seed, and when it's planted, it becomes the largest of garden plants. It becomes a tree where birds can nest in their air, but it doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes time for it to grow, that little seed for it to grow and become a large tree. And so we learn about the importance of patience and waiting as they're waiting for the wheat to mature to that day when the farmer says, it's okay to go in and separate the two. They're patiently waiting. And it's not just us that needs to learn about patiently waiting. It's also that we need to learn that God patiently waits. God waits on us sometimes who start out as weeds to become good. He doesn't wipe us off the face of the earth the first time we mess up or do something bad, right? He's got something called grace. He's patiently waiting on us. There's another parable that Jesus tells about the prodigal son. You know, the father in that, in that parable is patiently waiting for his son to come back. And he even notices when he's way off, and I think, I, every time I read that, I think it's because the father is waiting expectantly, hoping that the son's going to come back. That's how he sees him, so far off. It's not when the son comes and knocks on the door, it's that the, the father is standing there waiting, hoping that the son's going to come back. The father is God in that parable. The son is us. And so, you know, this parable teaches us that God patiently waits for us to become new and different and changed and good. But we aren't a patient people, are we? We don't like to wait. That's why they wanted to go pull the weeds out. They wanted to get rid of them right away. But good things come to those who wait. And if we patiently wait on others to experience something new and different in their lives, they might become good people instead of us having to write them off. This week, one evening, I planted a bunch of fig tree cuttings. There was a nice fig tree that I had planted at the Camden Community Garden, and it had two big branches that were starting to break off of the main trunk, and they would have caused a lot of damage to the main trunk. So I took a saw there this week, and I cut the two branches off, left a little bit on uh, that, so that it didn't damage the main trunk of the fig tree. And then I took all of the pieces of branch that were sprouting off of that and cut them, cut an angle, and I stuck them in the ground in my garden and other places. It's been so wet lately that they will sprout. 
And any of those that grow roots in later in the summer, we'll have figs. I didn't used to like them as a kid, but I love figs. I love making a, a fig jam. We like to put it on flatbread and make a, a pizza, a prosciutto, uh, fig jam, um, basil on the with some uh, mozzarella cheese. It's a really good pizza. But you have to wait. And it's important to wait. Another thing we learn from this parable is that good and evil coexist in the world, and navigating the two makes us stronger people. We know that. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Isn't that the line? <laughs> I mean, we, we would all like to avoid that. We just like to be made stronger, but sometimes we have to go through it in order to become stronger. And so good and, e and evil do coexist in the world, and navigating those two things makes us stronger people, and it also deepens our faith in God, who in the end has the final word. And we learn from this parable that God lets evil exist in our world. He doesn't create it. Now, I want to be very careful to, to draw the line. If you, if you look at that parable, the enemy sowed the weeds. God didn't. But God was the one who said, let them coexist until the time I tell you. So God lets evil exist in our world, but he doesn't create it. I know a whole lot of people who have this theology, this understanding that if they mess up, if they screw up, if they do something bad, God's going to get back at them. But that's not God. That's not what this parable says, and that's not who he is, despite what we think. He lets it, and yes, he could stop it, but he doesn't. He lets it coexist because it deepens our faith in him and it makes us stronger. So the next time we see someone and we begin to write them off, pause and remember the teachings of this parable. That God loves all people and God can transform any life. And when we write that, neck, that person off, we are in essence saying that we don't believe that God can do the work of transformation in their lives. Years ago, right here in this facility, we had a, a homeless gentleman come in who couldn't believe that we would let him in this facility. He kept he, he slept right over here the first time he was in the facility, and he kept saying, I kept waiting for lightning to strike me because I was inside of a church facility. And so I asked him a little bit about that. I said, why do you feel that way? And he said, well, you, if you, Pastor Martin, if you knew all of the things I did in my life, the bad things, the evil things, he said, I served time for harming someone. Lots of time. I haven't been a good person. I said, well, there's always opportunity, David, for you to change. And I took him under my wing in the two weeks that he was here. I took a special interest in him. I started asking him about, did he need some help finding a job? I started praying with him. I got him a Bible because he asked me for one. And I saw him sitting in here on his bunk reading that Bible. And then they left here and they went to another church and I'd go check on him. By the end of the shelter season, he had secured a job at Habitat for Humanity. And I, I'll never forget, I'd go by there for years. He worked there for about five, six years before his health declined to the point that he could no longer do it. 
But God totally transformed his life. And if we had just written him off, if we had just said, oh, you're some dumb bum, you're not worth anything, you've killed a person, it doesn't matter that you served your time, would he have changed? I don't know. I don't think so. Same thing the other week <laughs> when I just said dumb bum, I thought about it because I uh, walked into the shelter uh, the night, uh, one night, and there sitting at the front desk was a former client who I'll never forget. When he walked in here the first time, he said to me, I'm not a bum like the rest of these guys. He carried his cot in, his own cot. He didn't want to use their cots. He didn't want nothing to do with them. He said, I'm just, I'm not one of them. Yet he had a problem. Alcohol had a hold of him. And I'll never forget, I went from here one morning. I had spent all night, and I went downtown to see uh, the then... Um, Governor Hogan and Peter Francho, the um, what, what, comptroller in, in Maryland, they were talking, one's Democrat and one's Republican, and they were talking about how they worked together across party lines and the oddity of that. I walked into that gathering, and when he, we left that morning, he looked like a bum. But when I got there in that gathering, he was sitting right in front of me in a pressed white shirt, Dress pants, a nice set of shoes. He actually was a homeless real estate agent. Yeah, talk about an oxymoron. But he knew who he was. And now he's serving at the shelter. I think regularly, right? You see, it's not just what other people do to us. It's also what we do to ourselves and how we view ourselves. We're beloved children of God, no matter how messy our lives are. Don't ever forget that. God will do the weeding. It's not our role. How do you want to talk back this morning? What thoughts, what stories, comments, questions? Quiet. Any online? None? All right. Is the musician going to make us late this morning? Oh, you got you, you you got fifteen minutes, Carly. You can sing that song ten times. Our final song. Try my best, just don't get it right Well, I talk good talk, but I don't walk I miss the moments right before my eyes Somebody with a hurt that I could have felt Somebody with a hand that I could have felt I just can't see past myself Help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. The 
There's no denying I have changed. I've been safe from who I used to be. Even at my best, I must confess I still need help to see the way you see. Somebody with a hurt that I could have felt. Somebody with a hand that I could have felt. I just can't see past myself. Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. A little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. Let us pray. God, thank you for your patience with us. As we grow and become the beautiful person that you created each of us to be. Thank you for your grace that you extend to us each and every time we let you down. Thank you that you don't just wipe us off the face of the earth in that first moment, that you're patient with us, that you know what we can become, and that you continue to reach out again and again to call out the good from deep down within. And because we're grateful for the grace that you extend to us in our lives, Lord, help us to extend that grace to others. Help us to refrain from judging others. Help us to look for the good in every person we see. Help us to be a little more like Jesus and a little less like me. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go in peace.